in our second week of just entering into worship a little bit differently. And I'm actually really, really excited for this morning. I just love how God has been challenging me and us as a house of what worship is and just getting us to stretch our minds of how we enter into worship with him. And I think for me, the main thing about worship is is really just focusing on how good God is. Amen? Yeah. And so this morning, we're, we're really going to lean into that, um, lean into the focus of how good God is, and just celebrating who he is in our lives. Um, but we're actually going to start off with a liturgy that each of you guys should have a piece of paper in front of you. It is called A Prayer to Welcome the Sabbath. as just to set the intention and just to put our focus on him this morning and we just want to create space for him to come in and to encounter us we're not just merely reading these words but we are welcoming God into this moment so feel free to read along with me Lord of liberation, by the rhythm of your truth, set us free. From the bondage and baggage that breaks us, from the pharaohs and fellows who fail us, and from the plans and pursuits that prey upon us. Lord of resurrection, may we be raised into the rhythm of your new life, dead to deceitful calendars, dead to fleeting friend requests, dead to the empty peace of our accomplishments. To our packed full planners, we bid peace. To our over-caffeinated consciousness, we say cease. To our suffocating selves, Lord, grant release. Drowning in a sea of deadliness and death chimes, we rest in you, our lifeline. By your ever restful grace, allow us to enter your Sabbath rest. As your Sabbath rest enters into us. In the name of our creator, our liberator, our resurrection and life, we pray. Amen. Amen. So with these words in mind, I just felt the Lord... um, want to invite, pardon me, want to invite us into actually a moment of silence with him. We're often surrounded by a lot of noise. And I felt like the Lord just wanted to calm everything down and just to invite us into a moment of awareness with him. You don't need to be productive in this moment at all, but just to actually rest in that Sabbath that we were just reading about. And just before we get into that, um, there's one scripture that really stood out to me this week was Exodus 14, 14. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. So there's power in stilling ourselves before the Lord and knowing who he is and recognizing who he is. So we're just going to take a couple minutes as a family just to rest in that silence this morning.
feel like some of us in silence feel like we have to fill the space. I know I did in that moment. And it was a challenge for me to surrender just to the silence, to not have to perform or produce. So God, we just surrender ourselves this morning before you, God. We surrender ourselves to your presence, to your awareness, to your goodness, God. And we just receive from you, knowing that we don't have to do a thing just to receive from our Father. So let us drink of that truth, that we're welcomed into your presence before we've even done a thing. That we're just simply wanted by you, that you just want to be with us, that we don't have to do a thing. Would you just increase our ways of surrender throughout our week, God? That when we find ourselves wanting to perform for you without even realizing that we would just surrender to your love. And that we begin to understand even on a deeper level of who we are in the kingdom and who we are to you, our Father. So we're going to transition from this moment of silence to actually just a moment, a just a time of reflection with the Lord. So I'm actually just um, going to play over you guys while you actually flip over that liturgy. And we have some pens there for you. So one of the ways that we can worship is just by thanking the Lord. Um, just gratitude. And maybe there was nothing like super obvious, maybe you didn't have a huge breakthrough this week, but was, was there someone that encouraged you? Was there someone that comforted you? Um, did you see a beautiful bird that totally mesmerized you? Like that, that is worship. So I just wanna, you guys to take the next few minutes just to begin to write down just points of gratitude, points of thankfulness and I just, I felt to share this. I, one of my deepest encounters with the Lord, where I was delivered, where I encountered the depth of his love actually came from gratitude. It started with gratitude. So it is a key in our lives of worshiping is to have thanks on our lips. Um, my friend Nadia always says, thankfulness is the currency of heaven. So let this be your worship this morning. It's just gratitude in whatever form that is.
and she's just gonna sing, or not sing, I mean, can you sing? <laughs> just uh, read Psalm 145 over us this morning. Exalt to you, my God, the King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. I will honor your name forever and ever. Yahweh is great and highly praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation will declare your works to the next and will proclaim your mighty acts. I will speak of your splendor and glorious majesty and your wonderful works. They will proclaim the power of your awe-inspiring acts and I will declare your greatness. They will give a testimony of your great goodness and will joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and great in faithful love. The Lord is good to everyone. His compassion rests on all he has made. All you have made will thank you, Lord. The godly will praise you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom and will declare your might informing all people of your mighty acts and of the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your rule is for all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his actions. The Lord helps all who fall. He raises up all who are oppressed. All eyes look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and gracious in all his acts. The Lord is near all who call out to him, all who call out to him with integrity. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry for help and saves them. The Lord guards all those who love him, but he destroys all the wicked. My mouth will declare Yahweh's praise. Let every living thing praise his holy name forever and ever. Thanks, Rose. This, uh, this verse that Aaron read earlier in Exodus 14, 14, the Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. This number, 14, actually represents um, double completion, double perfection. And uh, Michael just reminded me this morning that there is double completion in our rest today, double perfection of God's heart to and his desire to, to heal this morning through our rest, through our contemplation, through our time of reflection this morning. So just be encouraged with that, that these moments in our week have so much value and it's our desire to move each of you into that place of of understanding intimacy with the Father and what that looks like and how this can bring so much healing in a time of, of such chaos. That is our prayer this morning as we lead you through this unique time of worship. We are on the thought of gratitude at this time. I want to invite Sue Ledoux up to the stage this morning. Sue is a dear friend who we love who's been a part of CLA for many years. You can grab that mic now. I think it's working. Thanks, guys. Sue is going to share um, a testimony of God's goodness in her life, representing her family uh, today. And we'll give you the stage for a few minutes. Yeah. I would have put my lipstick on, but um, last.
last week, uh, Cody. Oh, I want to find the skinny spot. So when you're on, on film, yeah. Um, last week, Cody, when um, we were doing our reflection, he came up and he said he had grabbed a piece of paper and it had a mom and a child on it. And he thought, great, that's not for me. But then God had spoken to him and said, somebody here was living with regret. And that was, I was the mom and Levi was my, the, the child. A year ago in August, um, Levi ended up in the hospital because he had overindulged in some alcohol and ended up actually in a coma for a night. And we thought that was the dark spot. Until November, we got a call. He had written us a goodbye note and asked us to look after his dog, and he left. He'd, I didn't know, but he had gone to take out garbage and didn't return. And we went searching. We called the police. We didn't know where to look. We didn't know where he was. And about 6.30 that night, he calls us from the South Campus Hospital because he had walked himself in because he didn't want to be here anymore. He had hit his dark spot. And I thought that was going to be our low, but that, that was just the beginning of the journey that we had to walk through. We had um, every counselor that we came into contact with, though, was a believer, which was incredible. It was all through Alberta Health Services and every every um, step that we had we had somebody that shared our faith shared our, our our beliefs and and encouraged us to keep walking and, and keep believing for Levi yeah. through that coming and coming and sitting in in church and there would be many Sundays I'd be sitting there and I'd look around and I think there is nobody else going through this stuff you guys all have your lives together and you should be grateful <laughs> But just to be, to be open and transparent, that wasn't easy. It wasn't us walking by faith and, and, um, and doing it correctly. There was a lot of regret. Levi still has a hard time letting me hug him because when I was hugging him before, it was to smell if there was marijuana or alcohol on him. And he got clued into that probably about two months in, and he said, that's it, no more hugging. <laughs> and he wouldn't let me go near him. And after church last Sunday, we were at home and I was explaining to Chet how, how church was and what was good and about the, re the regret. And, and Levi was there and I said, honey, do you have, have regret? And he said, yeah, he does. But he was glad to walk through what he did to get where he is today. And I thought that's, that's part of the regret. Hey, we need to release each other from the regret. I know we, that we messed up as parents, but Levi has loved us through that and told us, you know what, you did what you could with what you know. And we've released Levi, and he walked through what he needed to walk through to get where he is today. And the whole thing of and rejoicing and, and celebrating the little steps. We can look back now. I, Levi's got an 88 in math. This is, this is unheard of for, math, for Levi. He's getting up and going to school the way he needs to. He's, he's got friends. Now he weeded out friends out of his life for the first little while I was trying to do that for him and trying to control everything about this kid's life. And he's the one now making these choices. And we just need to celebrate the little things. Celebrate the steps when you're walking forward. Forgive yourself when you fall. Get back up. And allow each other to to, to be who we are and just be family and be real. So that's what. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let's celebrate. Thank you for the courage, uh, Sue, to share this morning. And more importantly, Levi, thank you for the courage to um, give mom permission to share. I believe that this moment, yeah. I believe this moment is going to be a moment of, of, of transformation for somebody in this room or somebody watching online today. We just trust the Lord with these things and allow Him to, uh, to speak to, to hearts. That's what testimony is all about, celebrating God's goodness. 
and his redeeming power in our lives every day. Um, Shelly is here with us this morning. Shelly, Ruli, we love you. Come on, let's, let's show her how much we love her. Shelly and her family have gone through great tragedy this week, this past week. Um, many of you have heard um, they lost, Shelly lost her three-year-old grandson in a house fire. Uh, twin boys, one survived, one didn't, and the six-year-old older brother uh, survived as well. But there is great, great uh, trial that they are walking through. And she just returned from Edmonton where her son and daughter-in-law live just outside of Edmonton. And uh, just the, the fact that you are here today, um, the courage that it takes to be present, um, you're choosing to be here because you believe that your family is a part of the journey ahead. And you're modeling uh, vulnerability and you're modeling what it looks like to, um, to, to, to be open. Open to hearts that love you, that care deeply about you, often don't have the words to say in times like this, but you are saying yes uh, to family and yes to um, um, what, what, what it is that you're doing, I believe, and I, I, I recognize this just in your presence this morning, is you're saying there is, there is power and there is beauty in being a part of your faith community, and you're choosing to allow each of us to minister uh, into your heart today so that you can be filled and encouraged today to go back to your family uh, to, to bring the hope of Jesus. Shelly is the only one in her family who, who loves the Lord, who has relationship with Jesus, and we believe that that's going to change even through this very difficult time. And we're going to pray for you this morning as well and for the Ledoux family and, and all of you in this room that are walking through very difficult things. I will pray. Let's believe together. And those of you who are around Shelly, just uh, be present in this moment for her. And uh, on conclusion of the prayer, I'll invite Nadia up to, to continue on in this, this time of worship. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your presence. Lord, it was only just a few short years ago where my family walked through a very similar loss. And it was in those days that followed where the presence of God was more tangible and more present in my life than I had ever experienced before. And that's what you do, Holy Spirit. You come, you come, and you, you surround us like a shield in our darkest of moments, in the, 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 the places of question, the moments where we do not understand, where we have more uncertainty than we do uh, confidence. You come and you bring hope, and you bring a presence that I believe transforms us from the inside out and that is something I can speak with confidence because I've experienced it in my own life and in my own family and Father today we pray a protection around Shelly around her son, her daughter-in-law, the grandkids the aunts and uncles the cousins, all of those that are represented Lord would you surround this family during these very very difficult days I pray a hedge of protection around mom and dad today as they go through these very, very difficult weeks ahead, wondering what this new normal is supposed to look like and trying to navigate through that. Lord, I pray that even though their understanding of who you are is just beginning, would this be something that overtakes their life and they experience your presence and your grace and your peace like never before. We agree for that together across this room. We agree, God, that you are going to make a way to what seems impossible. I pray protection around that marriage today in Jesus' name. Would you bring them closer together? Would you remind them of why they are 
a family, why they chose each other? Would they have strength not just for the other two boys but for each other in this season ahead? Would they see that they don't have to walk this alone, pray against isolation and, and, and moving away from and would you give them courage to move towards help and to, towards a family and friends and environment that will bring hope to their situation? Lord, bring the right counselors, the, the right advice during these days, I pray. In Jesus' name, I thank you for the Ledoux family. And we celebrate what you're doing in Levi's life, how you are walking this out with such uh, intentionality, Lord. You are moving not just through his life, but through the family, which ultimately influences many, many others. I pray protection around them as well. Would Levi recognize more than he's ever before, Lord, his identity in you, the plans, the purposes that you have for him and for his future. We celebrate the wins and the breakthroughs. We celebrate your grace, your patience for each of us, for every need represented here this morning, Lord. Would you be the one who orders our steps for those who are holding on to control and to trying to figure this out on their own. Would there be just a moment today of, of surrender, a releasing of control and giving it to you so that you can move us forward as individuals, as couples, as families, as, as, as a church community, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Many of you know Nadia. She's a part of our team here. She's going to uh, lead us in just the very last part of our worship moment on this morning. Thanks, Nadia. Um, I'm going to be reading from 1 Peter 4, 8 to 11. So if you have your Bibles, I'm reading out of the Passion. Above all, constantly echo God's intense love for one another. For love will be a canopy over a multitude of sins. Be compassionate to foreigners without complaining. Every believer has received grace gifts. So use them to serve one another as faithful stewards of the many colored tapestry of God's grace. For example, if you have a speaking gift, speak as though God were speaking words through you. If you have the gift of serving, do it passionately with strength that God gives you. So then everything, God alone will be glorified through Jesus Christ. For him belong the power and the glory forever throughout all of the ages. Amen. So we just want to invite you guys into an activation. Um, there's a page on your seat that says faith spelled risk. Yeah, see so if you guys want to just grab that. Um, and we're going to write a word of encouragement for somebody else on the back of it. So we're going to take a couple minutes as Aaron plays. And um, it's one of those things like we, we share the testimony of Jesus because that's the spirit of prophecy. So it opens us up to have the faith for more. And the Bible says that my sheep hear my voice. Um, so if this is something that you've never done before or feels a little bit uncomfortable, it's honestly just being like, okay, God, what do you say? What are you saying? What's an encouraging word for somebody else? And then we're going to have some of our leaders come and retrieve the papers from you guys. And then we're going to, um, we're going to give them out. And then the Holy Spirit is going to to guide us in who receives that word. So when you get your word at the end of this, you're going to read it knowing that the Holy Spirit has given that word for you, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, if you don't have a pen, just put up your, your hand and we'll try to get you a pen. Um, but there should be some on your seat. And just go ahead and take a moment, ask the Holy Spirit to, to just show you what God is saying for somebody else, and then we'll distribute those to one another.
leaders that are in charge of each section want to just come forward and grab the basket. You guys can feel free to put your name on it if you want to, but you can leave it anonymous um, if you don't want to.
as we're passing those out, Aaron's just going to continue for a moment longer, and then we're going to have Cody come and share the word with us. bit of an unorthodox worship service that we've had this last week and this week um, and I love it personally I think it's a beautiful thing to get out of the parameters and the boxes that we may have we may have projected the word worship onto and so there's a beauty in the silence there's a beauty in the noise there's a beauty in the in-betweens and so these are just some avenues that us as a staff have decided to go into to kind of diversify the way that we may hear God's voice, diversify the way that we may worship God, diversify the way that we may. And it's been beautiful and I've loved it and I hope you have loved it. Um, And if not, 
that's okay as well because we all worship in our own ways so that's part of the beauty of it um yeah this morning i'm going to be sharing with you uh first i just oh he's not even in here i wanted to say i was proud of levi but whatever i'll tell him later i guess <laughs> classic he's probably out there just sitting on the couch but um <laughs> uh yeah, this is this is good. Uh, I'm going. If you if you're unfamiliar, if you haven't been around for the past month or so, we've been in a kind of a dual series, I would say, where it's uh, we've been touching on the book of James in the Bible, as well as we've been having a bit of a prophetic series going on. So we had Tim share last week on the book of James. The week prior, we had Nadia share on the prophetic. The week prior to that, we had Luke share on the prophetic. And so um, I believe a diversity of voices is very important um, within a church. And um, there are things that a lot of us, we have different views on, we have different experiences in, we have different journeys. And so there are different avenues and different places that each one of us is able to speak to that maybe some of us are not able to as well. So that's why we've been diversifying it quite a bit and I love every moment of it. And even the week before we had Luke, um, God kind of took the service and we, we, we didn't know what was going on and we had some cool healings happening. We had people's hearts transformed. We had some really amazing things happen and that is just part of what our heart is at CLA is we, we want to come to God with an open hand. And I think a lot of times we like to clench our fists and we like to be in control and we like to say this is how you move God and this is not how you don't move God. And as long as you move this way, I'm comfortable. And if you don't move this way, I'm comfortable. And let's leave it at that. And then I'm going to be happy and I'm going to have a good time. Um, but unfortunately, that's not what I believe to be the way of followers of the way of God. Um, we need to have open hands and we need to allow God to move however he wants to move in the moment. And that is what I hope to do this morning. And that is what I hope that uh, our heart and the DNA of CLA will be. And so... Uh, as we go in, I I felt as though I was actually supposed to do some prophetic words and give some prophetic words, or if you're unfamiliar with that word, some encouraging words to those of you that are here this morning. And I, we haven't thus far in our series seen a practical example of this, at least from a stage. And I felt like this is kind of the week for us to do that. Um, and so I'm going to do that. But before I go into that, I just want to I want to give a preface and I want to go over some of the basics in case you've mi missed some of the prior weeks. So you're not like, what the heck is going on here? This is super weird, etc. And honestly, maybe it is still super weird. That's fine. Um, God has a lot of weird stuff that happens, especially if you read the Old Testament. There's some stuff that is pretty out there. And so we're just going to go with it. But so the heart of prophecy um, in, in 1 Corinthians 14, 3, it kind of sums it up. It says that the one who prophesies, he speaks to people for their strengthening, their encouraging, and comfort. So I'm, uh, my endeavor is not to come up here and berate you and, and bring pain and discomfort and anxiety and stress. Um, because if the fruit of someone's word, a prophetic word over your life, are those things, if, it, if the fruit are anxiety, if the fruit is stress, if the fruit is bitterness or unforgiveness, then I believe that it has been done unwell and it has not been done properly. And so first and foremost, the heart of it is that um, we would be able to experience God through each other. And sometimes it's this weird thing where God kind of forces us to be in community. And sometimes I actually hate that. I wish God, why don't you just tell me this stuff? Like, I can hear your voice. Why don't you just let me know what you think about me? Um, but no, he's, he's created a, a system and a model of community where sometimes the breakthrough that we need or the voice or the words that we need to hear from God will come through another person. And it'd be easier if maybe this wasn't the way, but unfortunately sometimes it is the way and along the way a lot of people have gotten hurt by that and there has been manipulation there has been things that were not of god there have been things that were quite and quite anti-christ in nature that have come under the guise of prophecy and so my goal is to eliminate that my goal is for cla to be a place where we can encourage one another where we can be honest with our feedback as well 
And so that's a thing this morning that if you have a negative experience or if something that I say doesn't make any sense in the moment or it actually causes you anxiety, stress, those things that I had mentioned earlier, please come talk to me about it afterwards. Um, I, I don't want this to be a place where I'm just spouting off words to people and it's going to cause you these thoughts and you're going to actually, if you hold on to something that you feel as though is not for you, it, then bitterness can take hold of your heart and then before you know it, you start resenting the person that gave you that word. But if we have a culture where we actually give feedback and say, hey, um, this is, I, like, I love that you stepped out, I love that you risked, I love that you gave me a word, and some of these, like, I like this point and this point, but when you said this, I actually perceived it this way. And this is what it made me feel like. Because in turn, not only are you creating a healthy system where you're giving healthy feedback, but the person giving the word now knows, oh, maybe that wasn't actually God's voice. And so you begin to refine and prune the hearing of God's voice in your own words that you're giving people so that through the feedback, you're not in a perpetual cycle of brokenness when you're giving words. Because if you don't get a feedback, you might, you don't, you may not even know you're doing it wrong. You might not even know that it's not from God. And so it's huge to give feedback. And so again, if, if this morning you have something that doesn't sit quite right with you, um, please come talk to me because we want to create a culture where there's brave communication and that we are healthy in doing this. Um, as well, I, there, so there, that's kind of a twofold part where there might be something that I say and you're like, that makes absolutely no sense or that's not for me. And it might not even be negative in nature. Um, but this, I, I was about two weeks ago. So if you don't know, I did ministry school at Bethel four years ago. No, I graduated. I, I was there for three years. And on our last day of third year, so in third year, you're an intern. So you're kind of in charge of like first year students. And so you have like 10, I had like 10 students guy students that I was kind of pastoring and so they gathered all the first years in our group together and then they all gave us words like on the last day of our third year at Bethel and so I, I remembered I was just driving home from the mountains and I remember that oh I think I still have some of those voice memos like on my phone because I had recorded it when they had given it to me and so one of them was when we had that graduation and it was I think 25 minutes long and I, I mean, I'm driving home from the mountains. What better thing do I have to do? So I just, I turned it on and I started to listen. And I haven't listened to these words in four years. Um, and so the first, the very first word was one of my students. And she started to do, like describe me as this dagger that like pierces through people's skin and it can go into the bone. And ironically enough, I literally have like a, I got a tattoo in August of a dagger that's like going through my skin. And I, I had no like recollection of this word, but I'm like, this, this girl's literally describing like the tattoo that I got. And it didn't even necessarily have the same meaning, but I thought that was my like jaw hit the ground. I was like, this is wild. Okay. So first one in, let's go. And then I listened through, I listened through some and some of them honestly still made no sense to me. Um, you know, there's the, the, the word that like, you're going to be a businessman. And if you know me, like numbers are not my thing i failed math in high school they let me go like they're like if you go into the dumber math level we'll put you through to grade 11 but like if you you, you have to like you're at a 45 we'll give you that five percent you can move on so we're getting the i'm getting these words about business and like math numbers i'm like come on man you might have missed the mark there but it's fine like he's trying the guy's trying so again some of these words might not make sense, but there's no harm in it. Like his heart was to, to encourage me. His heart was to love me in that moment. His heart was to be a friend to me. And so I'm not going to resent that word, even though it was a little bit off. It makes no sense. And honestly, in Christian culture, I think we love to like resent. We love to like make an excuse to not like something about someone a lot of the time. And it's something that I've actually really noticed, especially in the political climate that we find ourselves in. There's always an excuse as to why I disagree with someone. Like open your Facebook page for one moment and you, all you see is disagreements. And I, it's not God. It's not God to resent one another. It's not God to cause division. It's not God to get a word from someone and then let bitterness root in your heart and then say, oh, that person, that person will never hear from God because maybe they missed a moment. And so anyways, we continue on in this word and I get to the very last 
the very and it was actually it was amazing because all these people for, are from around the world and so i would have like oh there's someone from with a norwegian accent giving me a word oh there's like southern american oh there's a south african so it was like we had this diversity of accents throughout so it kept my attention and so we get to the last one and there was this guy from england and i actually forgot it like i was like i know this guy but i forget his name which sounds so bad but he started giving me this word and to a t it was exactly where i was right now in my life like like stupid accurate i was just like i was just like are you just the words and it's like there's no way that anyone would know that about me or if my close friends they'd be like okay that's that's literally you and so i heard god say when i was hearing this i was like four years ago that word meant nothing to me four years ago that in my books that word was a miss so to speak um but then i listened to it four years later and is exactly what i needed to hear and so that's another thing about prophecy is sometimes these words are not for the moment or the state or the season that we are currently in it's for a future season and so maybe that is something that you may experience today this morning um, maybe it's not for you and maybe it'll never be for you and that's fine but maybe four or five years from now you'll actually like god will bring to mind a word which has happened to me and it's like this is this is for me right now it wasn't for me then but it is for me right now so again i'm i'm prefacing with all of these things um and i want to get to to giving some words but i want to say just as a kind of a guideline because i'm teaching along the way but so what does prophecy look like and for me the, the greatest enemy of getting a prophetic word, of getting an encouraging word, of hearing the voice of God and giving it to someone is second guessing yourself. That that's the biggest enemy, that's the biggest thing that can cause you to kind of deviate from what God is telling you because sometimes it's so weird and it's so random that you think it must not be God. But the times that you actually act it out and you say, hey, listen, uh, like for example i was doing ministry and my friend beside me and we were just like giving out like words to people in the ch this church that we'd never been to before and he he was like this is super weird but i heard the word trauma and heard the word fridge is there someone that has trauma because of a fridge and like if i was getting that word there's no way i would i would have just been like okay i'm moving on like i'm not even gonna try this but like this lady starts bawling in the crowd and like weeping and it's like this she, she, we figure out later that when she was a child, her parents would literally lock her in a refrigerator. And like, she had so much traumatic incidents from this moment. And that word was saying that God was, he sees you in the dark places. He saw you in that moment and he sees you right now. And it was one of the most beautiful moments that I've ever seen, but it's so random. But at the same time, there's so much health and healing that comes from it. So don't second guess yourself. And God can speak to you through so many substrates we can see pictures in our minds. I think that's oftentimes the first kind of step that we do when we're learning about the prophetic is, okay, close your eyes and just think of a picture. Use your partner with your imagination. What is something that you see? And the first picture that you see, you just share, hey, I see a sailboat. Okay. And then the next step is, okay, God, what the heck does this mean? And then, the, okay, I see wind going in the sails and I feel like the wind is representing this, so and so. So that's kind of how we, we form. We, we ask one question at a time and oftentimes, like there's that office quote, I don't know exactly what it is, but Steve is, Steve Carell is like, sometimes I just start a sentence and I find out what I'm gonna say as I'm going through it. And that's literally like, sometimes when you're giving a prophetic word, hey, I just see, like I see this speaker over your life and you're just blank right after that word. And this person is looking at you intently waiting for like a divine revelation of the Lord and you have nothing. And then, but then it's like right at the moment where it become awkward, like the next step in the process comes. And it's, it's cool. It's like this partnership with God that um, we are, we are totally reliant on him. Everything in our lives, we have to be totally reliant on God. And we have to trust that he is someone that loves to give secrets. And I'm going to go into that later, a bit of a teaching, but beautiful secrets to be revealed to those that are around us. So again, pictures, you can get words, you can get sentences, you can get Bible verses, you can get, sometimes like I went through a season where I would start, like I would start praying for someone and then someone randomly from my life would pop into my head and I hadn't seen them for years. And then I would, so say their name was Stephen. 
and I would I would look up in my um, on the like internet. Okay, what does the name Stephen mean? And then it would have all of like the characteristics of what that name means. And I would say this person's name isn't Stephen that I'm praying for, but I'd say, hey, I just felt like you are blank 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 all of these attributes that the name Stephen means. And they'd be like, you just totally perfectly like told me what my personality is like. And so. It can be someone's appearance, someone's clothes, maybe someone's a certain piece of article of clothing is highlighted to you. There's so many different avenues of how this can work. And as you kind of start and listen, the precision and the way that God speaks changes um, and you go through seasons of different ways. And so, yeah, that's a little bit of a thing there. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I haven't done this for a while. So I'm actually slightly nervous, maybe like 13% nervous. Usually I'm 0% nervous. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna go for this right now. And again, I'm gonna like I want to ask permission before I pray for anyone. So if if I call you out and I say, hey, I feel like I have a word for you, just give me like a like a this, and we'll, I'll just move on to the next person. And there's no there's no judgment in that. Like I I totally understand if you're uncomfortable with this, and we we want to ask permission before we ever pray for someone or do anything like that. Um, all right. So the first, the first person that I feel like um, was highlighted to me, uh, Rose, the lady who read the Bible verse at the front here. We've only had a few conversations. Are you you're gonna record it? Okay. Okay. Um. So. I wrote this random verse down on my screen and I didn't know I was even going to give a word for it, but it's, it's Luke 8, uh, verses 1 to 3 specifically. And so it says, After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Um, the twelve were with him, so his twelve disciples, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. And this verse, oftentimes I feel like is so overlooked, but this is actually the answer to how Jesus's ministry was funded as far as a practical application of how did he get money to travel? How did he get money for food, etc. So it says that these women actually funded Jesus's ministry. And specifically, the one in the middle, Joanna, it says that Joanna was the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's, house, Herod's household. So Joanna, she's married to this man, Chusa, who is literally the right-hand man of Herod, who is the one who tried to kill Jesus as an infant and gave out the mandate to kill Jesus. But it's, and, and some, um, some texts that talk about the early church say that Herod's daughter actually was the one that killed John the Baptist and beheaded him, like gave the order to kill John the Baptist. So here we have this, this crazy dichotomy of Herod who is trying to kill Jesus is actually inadvertently funding his ministry. And I, I feel as though God's saying like, there, there is a call on your life, especially for women, and especially like there's going to be this entrepreneurial thing, but it's going to be so outside of the box. And it's going to be this thing of like, um, I see like, like, I just see the word like influence over your life. And it's going to be influence to every single demographic of person. And when I, I, as I, as I said that, I heard the verse like become all things to all people, as Paul said. And I really feel like there's a gifting on your life, Rose, to become all things to all people. And like there's moments where you may be dealing with someone who has this kind of an issue, but you can, you have like, Sometimes people may not see it right away, but you have a really deep gift of empathy in your life where it's like, I actually, I'm going to step into the pain with this person and I'm going to be in it with them. I'm going to grieve with them. I'm going to be in silence with them. But then at the end of the day, you're going to be the one that grabs their hand and pulls them out of the pit that they're in. And so with that, it's both a, both a practical, like pulling out of the pit, like you're physically going to be there. But as well as I see like this financial um, entrepreneurial thing where you're going to be able to fund people's hearts and dreams. And I see you even just having an interaction with, with young women and saying, okay, what is your heart? And they, they, they open up their heart to you. And they're like, I just, I, I have all the 
plans. I have all the, the papers. I have everything I need. I just don't have the money to do it. And there's going to be a grace on your life to actually fund that and to be like, okay, let's do it. Let's do it. And so I feel like I see, even when I said that, I saw like a banner over you that God's just saying, let's do it. So the dreams and the desires and the passions in your heart, God is just saying, let's do it. The, and I feel like there's... Um, like your your dream, you you have a lot of dreams. You have a lot of big dreams, um, but and you feel as though they may take you 20, 30 years to accomplish as far as a practical timeline to accomplish the dreams. But I felt like God was saying, what if those things only take you five years instead of 30 years? Okay, so there's an invitation to dream more dreams and to dream bigger dreams with God because there's a place and there's a mantle in your life to influence those around you. There we go. One. <clears throat> Actually, this next one I feel like is for Aaron. Curveball, huh? <laughs> um, I was reminded of this quote from, an, from a Sufi guy, ironically enough, and he said, I am a hole in a flute that the Christ's breath moves through. I am a hole in, a fl in the flute that the Christ's breath moves through. And I feel like there's a mandate on your life where whenever you're worshiping and it's not a flute, uh, do you play the flute? <laughs> you used to play the flute, okay. But, but there's, um, when, you're, when you're touching the piano, when you're singing, there is the Christ's breath is actually flowing through you. And it's as if Christ himself is like coming through and, and sharing words through your worship. And I really feel like God wants to encourage your worship this morning. Like it's impacted, like as, as from a side note, like it's impacted my life so much. And there is, you've barely scratched the surface of what God is going to do in your worship. Like as far as like the depth of the earth is, you've taken a shovel and you've dug a hole like three feet in the ground. Like that's, that's as deep as you've gone so far, but there's so much more that God has in store for you. And... The influence that you're going to carry is going to be greater than you could ever imagine. Um, and I, I don't know why there's this theme of influence, but, and when you ask, okay, what does leadership look like? Leadership is influence. And so I feel as though, um, and this has already started obviously with your vocal lessons, but there's going to be a progression of from vocal lessons, lessons to worship lessons, where you are going to be able to like fully immerse yourself in the craft of leading people into worship, both how to worship and just like doing it yourself. And I just want to acknowledge you, like thank you for um, your heart to not perform. Your heart is not, I'm not coming up here just because like we're meeting on a 10 a.m. on a Sunday and I'm going to play the piano. We're going to sing three songs and we're going to go on our day. But it's like, I'm going to actually worship the King of Kings. You can join me if you want to, or you can just sit in your seat and not. Like it's up to you, but there's a decision where it's like, I'm here for, for, I'm here for the Father. I'm here for God. And I'm going to lay my life down in that way. And out of that surrender, out of that undoing, everything, all the fruit that you've been looking for is going to come. And the seeds that you're sowing are not in vain as well. Um, this word is a, it's, I'm not going to specifically say it's for someone, but um, I felt, I wrote it down yesterday, actually. Where was that? Um, you need to forgive yourself for what you perceive to be wasted time. You need to forgive yourself for what you perceive to be wasted time. And I feel like this is for actually numerous people in this room, but you look at your life and you say, you say, if only I had done this better, if only I hadn't waste, like maybe you went and you got a degree in school for four years and then you ended up doing a job that didn't even have to do with the degree that you got it in. Like this, that's not wasted time. Like there's, we like to compartmentalize and say, these are the moments that I was like with God and I was moving towards God and he was refining me and my identity and I was becoming who I am today. And then there's those moments that we compartmentalize and say they weren't a part of that. But you actually need to forgive your heart and say, I actually, I forgive myself for thinking that that's wasted time because it's all a part of the journey. It's all a part of the process and it's all beautiful. And when there's a forgiving that happens, that takes place, you're actually able to like, there's, there's a freedom, a residual freedom that comes from that.
Yeah, and uh, Tim, I... Is it good? We're good. Okay. <laughs> I just got to make sure there's no... Um, Tim Mount. But for some reason, I, when I say that, I hear like fountain. Fount. Mount Fount. Um, and I see this picture of this fountain. And it's a triple tier fountain. So there's the lower level, the mid level, and the high level. And the the mountain or the fountain has just been turned on to start cycling the water and it's filling up the top reservoir but you can't see it flowing out yet and i feel like you've turned on the tap so to speak of your life and there's water there's living water that is coming and you may not be able to see it fully yet but all it takes is one, one, that one drop that makes it cascade over and then it begins to fill the next level and then it cascades over and then it begins to fill the bottom. And in the bottom is when I just see like, like frogs and wildlife and vegetation and life and things start to grow and it starts to attract. And I feel like maybe there's this question in your mind where it's like, when, it, when is it gonna be my moment? When, when, like, when is it? Because there's a gifting and a calling on your life, but it's like maybe you haven't seen you haven't seen the life come from the the, the the seeds that you've been sowing and the sacrifices that you've been making. And I feel like God is just saying, "I'm filling up the top portion. I know it's 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 coming soon, and and, and it's gonna fill, and it's gonna be this splendid. I, it's like a Roman sculpted, like custom, one of a kind fountain because you're one of a kind, because you're unique, because the giftings and the abilities that God has given you in your life, nobody in this room has it. And so there's going to be people that are placed in your life that only you can touch their hearts. Only you have the key to their heart and none of us have a key that fits the slot. So just wanted to encourage you with that. I have 10 minutes. Okay. Um, I'm gonna okay I'm gonna like I'm just I had a little bit of a teaching that I felt like I was supposed to do so we're gonna go into this and uh, quickly uh, thank you Aaron for uh, sending the ambiance so the the one thing that I wanted to specifically touch on as, as in regards to prophecy is that prophecy always needs to be connected to friendship and even in our pre-service prayer this morning, Nadia was praying that we would be friends of God, that we would see the friendship of God. And I've said this on the platform before, but oftentimes we neglect the aspect of God that is friendship. And we see God as a savior. We see God as uh, a father. We see God as those different avenues, but God as friend is one that's kind of foreign to us. And so our friends are the people that we have fun with. Our friends are the people that um, when things go wrong, we, they're the first people that we go to. And so in regards to that, we need to be friends of God. And so my, my main verse this morning is ironically in Job. I feel like I'm preaching out of Job a lot lately, which is not normal, but I love Job. And it's actually probably one of my favorite Old Testament books now. And so the verse is Job 29 verses two to four. And so the context of this, if you're unfamiliar with that, um, Job is a man who is blameless before God. He loves God. But, and he has a healthy family. He has all of the monetary things that he could ever need. He has health. Uh, and then all of those things are taken away from him. So he is left with absolutely nothing. He is sick. His family dies. And all of his, his possessions are taken away from him. And so here we are in chapter 29. And this is Job's final defense to God. Because again, it says in, in verse 1 that Job is blameless. He's absolutely blameless before God. So he's, his, this whole book is a conversation between him and his friends. And his friends are blaming him for what he must have done wrong in order for these things to happen. And Job's response is defending himself, saying that these, there's no, I didn't do anything wrong, that I am blameless in God's sight. And so in Job 29, this is Job speaking. He says, Oh, that I were as in the, day, in the months of old. As in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone over my head and by his light I walked through darkness. And specifically, I want to I want to highlight this verse. He says, when I was in my prime, when the friendship of God was upon my tent. So when I was in my prime, the, the pinnacle of Job's life was when he was friends with God. 
And when, if you're wondering, what does that mean upon my tent? That just means the general, like his entire life. It's just a, a literary device used for that. So that's the NRSV translation that I just said that. When I was in my prime, when the friendship of God was upon my heart. So Job here is reminiscing on his past when he, he, he had it all. And he's like, God, we were friends. And you can almost feel this, like, this pain in his heart where it's like, it's almost as if he's lost a good friend. Like, what has happened? And so here we look at this word friendship in the Hebrew and this word is, is sowed. And ironically enough, this word sowed in Hebrew for friend is also the exact same word for secret. And so I want, I want to be honest from a hermeneutic perspective. So hermeneutic means the knowledge of an interpretation of the Bible. So interpretively, from a scholarly perspective, this could be just a coincidence. Um, and if just a short Hebrew lesson in classical Hebrew, which is what the Old Testament mainly is written in, there's only about 8,600 words total. Uh, and we have hundreds of thousands of words in English. So they have a very limited scope of the words that they can use. So one Hebrew word can mean five or six different English words. That's why we get it. Um, but again, I, I wanted to make that argument because I don't want to just say, oh, like this is this, is, this means secret and friends, so they must be coalesced together because I think from a, an intellectual perspective, people would rip me apart. Um, but I also want to say that if it is a coincidence, I believe that it's a divine coincidence nonetheless. And so here we, when we read the same verse in the International Standard Version, so again, I'm going to read the NR, NSRV, which says, when I was in my prime, when the friendship of God was upon my tent, the International Standard Version says, like when I was in my prime and God trusted me with his secrets. When I was in my prime and God trusted me with his secrets. And here we, have a, we could do a whole translation uh, teaching, but it depends on who translated it, what they felt like fit the mold best. But for the translations to have them both synonymously like that is, is quite cool, and I thought it was quite beautiful and so friendship with the divine and transformation uh, and secrets are synonymous in my eyes. And so when I say the word secrets, it's not this thing where God is going to tell you something and you get this, you have this sweet little secret that you have with God that you're never going to share with anyone else and you just keep hoarding these secrets to yourself over and over. Uh, that's actually uh, I, an early church heresy called Gnosticism believed that, if, that certain people had a certain secret to heaven and you had to be around Jesus or you had to know the right people to have this secret and then you would be saved. So the early church was quite against that. So this is not what I'm saying here. But the secrets that God tells us are hidden, beautiful identity, identity truths that we are meant to share with those that are around us. So step one is this friendship of God where we are friends with God and in that friendship place that we are trusted with his divine secrets. And it's this, this beautiful conversation of God coming up to you and saying, Hey, Cody, let me tell you something about what I feel about Caleb over there. Are, are, you, are you willing to share that with him? Because I really want him to know that he's loved. I really want him to know this. And I'm choosing you, my friend, to ent I'm entrusting you with that secret because I want you to share that with him. And so God entrusts us to the, be the tongues and the mouthpieces for God a lot of the times, which can seem daunting, but it can also be exhilarating. That God would choose us to live in community, that we would give words to one another, that we would actually be able to be the mouthpiece for God, for sometimes we can't, we can't hear God, but we can actually be that that mouthpiece, that mouthpiece that says, hey, this is what you're actually worth. This is what I think about you. And it all is coming from this place of friendship. And so it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 4, I gotta go through this quick. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just talking fast, I know, but I, I gotta blaze through. If I speak in the tongues of men or, or of angels... But do not have love. I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. 
So if you are, if you have this gift of prophecy where people come from around the world to see this, this gift that you have, but your gift is, there's no love in it. You're actually nothing. You carry no substance. You have no essence of yourself. And unfortunately, as I look at, at the climate that we find ourselves in, there are many prophets who, who are self-proclaimed a lot of the time or who other people have claimed because they have a like-minded mentality with them. And we have these prophets who they don't really understand the concept of without love you are nothing. Because they're using their words and their voices and their influence to divide instead of unite. And so we have this system where there's a group of prophets, and I use that in quotation marks, but they, they all have the exact same word. They all are backing the same person. They all say that this is God's chosen people. These are not God's chosen people. And then they find like-minded people to rally their cause. And so if you, even if you go to their Facebook pages, it's all people agreeing with them. But there's never a critical comment on, well, what, does this, what is the fruit of what you're saying right now? Because it's easy to mimic other people, and it's easy to say things that you feel like your followers, or the people that you influence, want to hear. And I feel like a calling on my life is to go against the grain, and if you don't like what you hear me saying, like, that's okay with me. But I'm not going to just sit by with the status quo and just allow things to continue in the way that they're going. Because I feel like the modern prophetic culture that we find ourselves in today, and I feel like a lot of people say, oh, there's so much health that's coming, and it's true, and we see it, and there's beauty in it. But a lot of it has caused more division than uniting in the church. And so again, if your word for someone dehumanizes the other, there's no love in it. If your word is for someone, but in that being for someone, it is for, not for someone else, I don't see love in it. And I'm seeing time and time again within my friends groups and within the people that I see in, in my daily circles or on, on, that I have interna- internet relations with. Not romantic. That was a weird word. <laughs> no. I don't have internet relations with anyone currently. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, the, uh, the dating apps didn't work for me, honestly, <laughs> um, but if, if, if the, and I just, I just find it ironic that it's always, a, it, f- to be for someone, it's always against someone else, and I'm like, this isn't how, like, no one is, this isn't helping anyone unless you agree with the person that's saying the words, this isn't helping a dying and broken world. And it all leads us back to friendship. So if you're withholding love from certain people in your everyday life, if you withhold love from people based on their religious affiliation, their political leaning, their ideological differences, you would probably withhold the secret God gives you for that specific person. If your love is preferential in your daily life, your love is going to be preferential when you're giving a word to someone. If your word is that you would try to twist and twist the word to fit your agenda and you would try to mold that person into something that you feel like they should be, there's no love in that. If you're just trying to create mini carbon copies of yourself, if CLA is trying to create CLAnites, CLAans, whatever we would call ourselves, if we're just trying to create little Tims, little Cody's, and we all think the same way, we all, it, we're not going to do anything in the world because we're just going to attract other little Tims and little Cody's. <laughs> Dan- it's, it's very dangerous. But again, I want to say that like the diversity of thought, the diversity of, hey, my love isn't going to have a preference for you because you believe the same things that I do. I'm going to love you regardless. And hey, I have this little secret that I feel like God wants to share with you right now in this moment. And I'm not going to try to fit it into an agenda or what it needs to look like. So utilizing the prophetic well looks like your love and friendship not having preferences over others. 
and I am quite over, so... Just a quick... Jonah, so... Oh, no, that's too long. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to pray. Is Aaron here? Oh, she's back there. I literally, I don't know why, I literally started going over here like I was going to play the keys for myself. Come on. It'd be terrible. Um, so, Jesus, I, I know that I was a little chaotic this morning, a little quick, but I pray that the words that people would need to captivate their hearts would be captivated. God, I pray that any word that I spoke in, if it was not laced with love or it was not received with love, Father, would you refine my words? because I'm growing, because I'm imperfect. But at the end of the day, my heart is just to know you, God. At the end of the day, our heart is just to know you, God. So Father, would CLA be a place where we could have a healthy culture of encouraging one another, not with the agenda of getting anything out of it, but simply out of friendship. God, would you place friends in our lives? I feel as though there are some in here maybe that you're, you're like, where are my friends? Where are those people that I can go to? Where are those people that I can laugh with? God, I pray that you would bring friends into those people's lives this morning. And God, I pray for those of us that have great friendships, have great friends, have beautiful relationships, would we continue on and never take them for granted? God, would you show us yourself in our friends this week specifically? When we laugh with our friend, we would be laughing with you, God. When we cry with our friend, God, we would be crying with you. And God, I pray that this week that you would give us secrets, not secrets to hold to ourselves, but secrets that we would give unto others. Hey, this is what you, this is how God thinks of you. This is how God sees you. And in this moment, you may not feel that way, you may not see it, but God wants you to know that you are known, that you are seen, that you are loved beyond a love that you could ever imagine. So Holy Spirit, move and do what only you can do. We can't change this world on our own, God. We can't change Calgary on our own. We can't change our friends on our own. We can't change our family on our own. thankfully we're not alone so father i pray for an awareness and a tangibility of your presence that it guides us that it guides every single movement that we make would our tongues be tongues of life and our words be words of love so i just bless everyone in here this morning god i pray that the conversation would continue, that the words would continue. This isn't just a Sunday morning thing, God. In Jesus' name.